We're going to talk about preventing burnout at work with emotionally attuned management. So here's our schedule today. We're going to do, we're going to label burnout. We're going to label attunement. Then I'm going to teach, I have six tips on how to attune at work. And um, then I'm going to go over how Tend Collective can help. And then there's going to be some resources to keep learning at the end. So hopefully this is a really quick overview, to be honest, of a lot of really intense and deep dive topics. Um, but hopefully there's a little something um, to get your wheels turning and enough to work with that, you know, once we get to like, these are some tricks and tips you can use at work, that you have something that um, you feel you can work with. That's the goal. I found the American Psychological Association definition of burnout, physical, emotional, or mental exhaustion accompanied by decreased motivation, lowered performance, and negative attitude towards oneself and others. So this is a result of prolonged physical or mental exertion or an overburdened workload. And what's interesting is that this has its roots in um, clinical work with heavy caseloads and secondary trauma from hearing other people's trauma, not getting enough breaks, not feeling um, supported enough. So that was in 1975. And I'm afraid it just hasn't gotten better, um, especially for those of us who do work with these really heavy topics. I think very intuitively, we know that this is just bad for people and business. All of the characteristics of burnout make it so that we're not able to really focus on our work and turnover um, can be really costly for companies. There's lots of factors that are making burnout especially potent in 2024 that don't just have to do with work. So um, we have kind of the work-related pieces in green, in brown, you know, maybe the, the other pieces in our society you know, the COVID pandemic was probably the most stressful thing any of us have experienced in our lifetime. There was so much uncertainty and um, a lot of grief. Many of us lost loved ones. It was really hard to see um, death at that scale. Um, and then also, of course, losing um, our interpersonal connections was really stressful. We're also facing the largest wealth and income disparities in 100 years. That's really weighing on us. Um and so, you know, there's so many, there's just so many factors here. Personal debt is really high. Cost of living is high. Pay is not keeping up. Um, and then, you know, just having not really a ton of protections at work in terms of worker rights um, or, you know, consistent health care. It's very stressful. Who is feeling burnt out? We might think that people at the top, you know, if you work for a corporation or a really big company, that they're kind of out of touch. And Deloitte did some research that showed, yeah, they they actually are. They interviewed a bunch of C-suite leaders. This was published in 2022 and found that 70% um, of people in these CEO, COO, CMO roles uh, are seriously qu considering quitting their job that better supports their well-being, which is kind of interesting, right? Because they're the ones in charge. <laughs> like I maybe just change it. Um, but then, despite the fact that they feel that way, their interpretation of how employees are feeling is way off. So the um, bright neon green column is self-reported well-being by employees. And the blue column is the C-suite's assessment of employee well-being. And you can see that there is a huge disparity in, in every one, physical, mental, social, and financial well-being. So if you're like, gosh, it just feels like they just don't understand. They don't. <laughs> they really don't. And that will, of course, fuel burnout. So this graph um, is showing the percentage of employees who say that they feel exhausted, stressed, overwhelmed, and lonely of employees and C-suite. So it's really everyone that's feeling this way, especially exhausted. So um we're kind of all in it together. Of course, different pay scales, depending on where you are in the company. So healthcare burnout, 
also very high, especially after and during the COVID pandemic. And of course, we're still we're still dealing with that. So very high rates. Um, social work burnout is huge. Um, and in a study published last year, less than half of those surveyed indicated that they intended to continue working in their position for five years. So that's devastating um, to know that less than half of social workers want to keep their role. And so turnover um, costs are so high. You know, if you have to let, if someone leaves and you have to bring in and train someone else, um, you're probably going to lose. I mean, it, it takes, I think, on average six months to train a new employee. So you're really losing that time and that salary. And so you can kind of say, oh, well, what's their annual salary? Let's say it's $100,000 you're losing $50,000 every time someone leaves. So that's that's really high. Um, additionally, um, high turnover in like child welfare systems um, result in, in less quality care for children and families served. And um, one study said that youth were more reluctant to trust others as a result of losing a caseworker. So there's a, actually a really high cost to burnout, especially in the social services sectors. Um, so the Surgeon General came out actually, and I don't know how many of you know this. I, I actually really didn't. I found this while I was creating this presentation. Oh, like they um, they know about burnout. Um, I actually got to see Vivek Murthy speak live at Boston University uh, last year, and he's wonderful, a uh, very empathetic and kind hearted man um, who really wants to make a difference in people's lives. And um, so their team at the office of the Surgeon General um, put out an advisory statement. And what I found really interesting about this is that these are all intuitive needs. Um, we kind of, we all know that this is what needs to happen, but also so many of them address the topic that we're talking about today, which is caring about each other and that interpersonal care and just how much of a buffer it provides to stress and burnout. So, you know, a couple of these items are transforming the culture, being responsive, listening to needs, listening to people, um, eliminating punitive policies for seeking mental health um, and substance use disorder care. Uh, we talk about that a lot at 10 Collective. We would really like to see the elimination of punitive culture and policies. Um, additionally, um, so let's see, prioritize social connection and community as a core value of the healthcare system. And I think that prioritizing social connection and community are going to be great for any system, um, any place of work. So enhancing job fulfillment. And of course, all of these um, items in the memo are backed by research. So um, feeling connected and belonging really protects against burnout and a lot of other mental illness. So there are so many factors and we really focus on the social ecological model here at 10 so that people don't feel like it's always your individual responsibility to change. Um, you know, like, you know, you just need to go to a meditation class or you just need to do more yoga. Um, certainly we recommend those things and we are going to touch a little bit on them today, but we're embedded in, you know, um, larger scopes of things happening, okay? So a larger ecology. So cultural and national, there are cultural factors, you know, like our kind of self-worth being tied to productivity. And then of course, we have a lot of policies that put um, the rights of corporations over the rights of citizens. And so um, institutional, we've touched on a few of these. CEO pay is higher than ever and there are fewer worker protections. We've really gone into a really large scale deregulatory movement since the early 70s, but it's feeling especially acute right now. Today's focus is gonna be on relational and interpersonal. How can we enhance this skill set to prevent burnout? So this, um, some of the barriers are just low people management skills and low social emotional skills. Um, you know, I went to elementary school in the 1990s and we didn't get any social emotional curriculum 
today's students, and I have visited like trauma-informed classrooms, um, they're getting social emotional skills taught to them at a young age. And so, you know, we, I went with my class at Boston University um, when I was doing my master's in public health and we all kind of looked at each other like, where's ours? Like we didn't get it. Um, and so that's um, a real barrier in the workplace when we don't have the needed skills to work together. And I just want to note that of course, um, having a marginalized identity increases um, your chances of getting burnout and exhaustion. So this includes being female, being non-white, or being a part of the LGBTQ community. Let's talk about attunement. So this is a word that has so many meanings, and it's kind of a beautiful word with all the meanings that it has. Um, here's the standard dictionary definition, to bring into harmony. And I love that definition. And so um, we are going to think about bringing into harmony um, and apply it to the workplace setting. So um, I'm going to play a really short, I think about one minute snippet of this amazing choir from South Africa um, singing a song. And what I want you to pay attention to while it's playing is how well the singers are able to attune to each other. So they're able to sing. They're able to sing the correct note. They're able to sing the correct rhythm. They're able to listen to the people around them. They're able to watch the conductor and they're able to sync up with the rhythm section. And they're able to do this really flawlessly because they are in harmony um, and attuned to each other. Some nights I stay up cashing in my bad luck. Some nights I call it a draw. Some nights I wish that my lips would build a castle. Some nights I wish they'd just fall off. But I still wake up, I still see your ghost. Oh, I am still not sure what I stand for. Oh, oh, oh. And I wanted to make sure to get a shot of the conductor. This is a very joyful conductor um, because we want to kind of think about being the conductor of bringing everyone into harmony when you're managing people at work. Um, and so he is listening and attuning um, and he has really practiced and rehearsed all of this over and over and over. So he has like a really robust skill set to be able to attune to everyone and create this really beautiful piece of art. And I think, you know, a lot of us um, initially thought, I'm going to go get my dream job and I'm going to go create beautiful work in the world. And I think it's been disheartening to have that um, squashed at some points in our career when we work with um, certain maybe toxic leaders or environments that are chaotic. Um, because I think that really like deep in our hearts, we really, really want to come together and work together to create beautiful things, take care of people. You know, if you work in social work, you, you really wanted to make a difference and care for others. Um, if you work in healthcare, you know, wanting to help keep people healthy and safe and, um, it can, you know, it can be done. And so I do highly actually recommend, um, watching YouTube videos of choirs when you're feeling discouraged because the ability for them to work together to create something beautiful is like so inspiring and reminds me of, you know, the power of the human spirit. And um, I used to sing in choirs like from high school and my young adulthood. And actually I'm like, I think I need to, I think I need to do that again. I think it's going to be really good for my mental health. So um, this is such a good one. We're going to talk about emotional attunement. 
um, interpersonal and relational attunement and intrapersonal attunement. Um, and we're going to talk about it in the context of the workplace and managing people, but we do borrow from other realms. So, you know, there's a lot of work out there on attunement in relationships, um, uh, romantic relationships, you know, like John Gottman has done a lot on that, um, the Love Lab in Seattle. And parenting, there's so much on attunement and parenting. So we are going to borrow from those realms and apply it to the workplace. So here's a different, um, a different definition of attunement, relational attunement, is a kinesthetic and emotional sensing of others, knowing their rhythm, affect, and experience by metaphorically being in their skin. So that's kind of almost a spiritual definition a little bit, but um, we will talk about there's a lot going on in the brain when we attune to others. But when we are present and picking up on all these signals, um, it really does allow us to attune to, gosh, I wonder what this person is thinking and going through. And it really does create more harmony. Okay, so I am going to play um, a clip. I think it's a minute and a half um, of the still face experiment. This is really the basis of a, a lot of what we know about attunement. And um, the video, it's possible it could create a stress reaction in you. So I just want to say, be mindful of that. If you just need to step away, or if you're watching the recording, just skip ahead a minute. Um, or you can, um, and here's a tip, you can actually um, do a resilience, personal, intrapersonal resilience activity, which is to pick a body part that feels strong and focus on how strong that part of your body is. So you could even like clench your fists a little bit and just notice how strong you are. And that can get us through these moments where we may feel babies crying tends to be triggering, especially if um, you yourself experience some uh, trauma in childhood. I am going to stop the clip before the baby um, cries too much. So we will just see a little snippet of that, but just a heads up. And this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I mean like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions. They so the baby actually continues to have a really negative response that's um, really intense. But then um, rest assured, the mom engages again and baby is happy again. And this, um, uh, you know, baby is in a happy, health, safe environment with a mom that it knows is safe. And there's also a, a dad and baby version of this, which is great. Um, and so, you know, the first time I watched this video, suddenly a whole lot of things came into view for me and a lot of things really made sense around um, how much we're wired to connect with each other and how much we are attuning in every given moment. So the mom is making a micro facial expression and the baby is reacting and then the baby makes um, a micro expression and the mom is reacting and there's just so much being picked up and shared and changed. Right now I'm gonna point, now I'm going to look. Um, but we're really, we're really looking at um, so we're reading so much on the face and so many emotions. Um, and the thing is we're, we're wired to do this from birth. 
I always say there was never a time on earth when there was only one human. We've always been wired to connect with each other. Um, we have to for survival. And that need doesn't exactly go away. It's not like we get into to adulthood and suddenly we don't need to attune or connect with others. We really, really, really do. And so what is it like to be around managers and colleagues who don't or can't attune to us in some way? And how does that impact our stress level? We saw the baby just freak out. And I want to encourage you to evaluate whether that happens to you. When you are spending time with people that, you know, at work, we can't just choose like, you know what? I'm done with you. I'm going to not work with you anymore. Like you have to work with these people. And when it feels like it's off, there's discord. Um, and of course there's healthy, there's, there's definitely, we could do a whole webinar and really healthy conflict, of course, but, um, just miss attunement, miss attunement and without repair, it's, it really, really impacts our stress level. And we will then have the propensity to become this, you know, freak out, freaking out baby, you know, why, why aren't you paying attention or why, why are you doing it like that? And I'll give some examples in the workplace of what that looks like. So this is an amazing, amazing book written by a group of psychiatric researchers at the University of California, San Francisco Medical School. Um, I cannot recommend this book enough. Um, and in fact, I often see, you know, if there's like an internet um, influencer psychologist, their content always reminds me so much of this book. So I think um, some people are borrowing heavily without citing, I've noticed. They're, this is the one. If you're kind of like, wow, that's so insightful. How did they say it like that? I think they got it from this book. So um, they say, even after a peak parenting experience, children um, never transition to a fully tuning, self-tuning physiology. Adults remain social animals. They continue to require a source of stabilization outside themselves. That open loop design means that in some important ways, People cannot be stable on their own, own, not should or shouldn't be, but can't be. This prospect is disconcerting to many, especially in a society that prizes individuality as ours does. Total self-sufficiency turns out to be a daydream whose bubble is burst by the sharp edge of the limbic brain. Stability means finding people who regulate you well and staying near them. So we need each other. We we have to. <laughs> so thinking about attunement in the brain, we have the limbic system, which is responsible for um, emotion regulation, processing, and detecting safety or threat, hormones, memory. The orbitofrontal cortex connects the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. Um, and it's responsible for evaluating stimuli and deciding if things like verbal communication or nonverbal and emotional communication or um, body language um, and sending that in and, and so that we can decide whether something is safe or not. And of course, we're doing that in, you know, milliseconds. Mirror neurons um, fire when we see others. So someone has an emotion. And so, you know, we have mirror neurons so that we can feel basic empathy. Um, and they're all working together. And of course, um, if we have decided that the situation is not safe, and of course we're doing that really, really, really fast. Um, Malcolm Gladwell did a book called Blink in the early 2000s about, um, he called it thin slicing. Um, we're making these decisions without thinking about them. And then there was a book by Daniel Kahneman, um, a researcher called Thinking Fast and Slow. So we have the slow thinking brain and we have the fast thinking brain and we kind of have to know how they all work. But so it's typically our fast thinking brain that's deciding if it's safe or not. If we've decided it's not safe, then the limbic system and specifically the amygdala comes online so that we don't die, basically. And we are constantly reading cues and quickly labeling them as a safety, um, safety or threat. So, you know, the classic example is always like running from a tiger. So we have to mobilize really, really fast split seconds to make sure that we keep ourselves safe. And so when it comes to the um, attunement video with the baby, the still face baby experiment, the thing is, is that um, some people were going to have safer attunement and attachment at home in their early years than others. And that's going to leave an imprint for how well we can do that into adulthood.
this is the list of the 10 adverse childhood experiences. So there's different types of abuse, neglect, and household stress. Um, and so different people that we work with, um, or we want to think about ourselves or our managers, um, are going to be able to attune better or worse, depending on how much stress we grew up with or how well our caregiver was able to attune to us. And I think there's some grief that can come up when we realize that maybe not all of our needs were met. Um, but um, I think what's really nice is that there's always um, healing that can be done and there's always skills that can be learned. I, this quote came up on my feed, speaking of influencer therapists. Um, uh, this one is the millennial therapist, Sarah Kubrick. Um, emotional maturity is when you recognize how you feel before your actions have to tell you. And I really liked that because, um, that is, <laughs> that is the goal when an emotion can arise and you can go, Oh gosh, I, I felt really embarrassed. So I'm going to just hold that in and, and hold space for myself and that feeling instead of lashing out at everyone I'm talking to and ruining this whole, uh, meeting or event, you know, as a result of my embarrassment that I'm not acknowledging. So at, at work, you know, things come out sideways when we don't acknowledge them. So, um, you know, different passive aggressive things, ignoring people at meetings, not giving, not, um, bringing people in to, um, participate in different projects and work, um, being aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we all can think of times when we've experienced this, um, at work and it doesn't feel very good. Of course, she uses the term emotional maturity, um, but I kind of prefer emotionally skilled because these are skills that we can learn. So I don't want anyone to feel ashamed and we wanna try not to do um, shaming language, but rather um, it's an emotional skill set when you can recognize how you feel um, before your actions have to tell you. Inter intrapersonal is uh, to ourselves, okay, inside. And this is really important um, when we think about reducing burnout at work to start with ourselves, okay? So intrapersonal attunement is about knowing how we're feeling, knowing which situations are stressful and triggering and maybe what we need, um, knowing what different emotions feel like in the body and being able to use language to describe them. So interpersonal emotional attunement is knowing how other people are feeling. And there's an integral relationship between knowing how we feel and how others feel. It's going to be really, really, really hard for us to attune to others when we have that um, inability to know and label emotions for ourselves. So interpersonal is, do we know how they're feeling? Do we know what trigger, what might trigger them? And now, of course, we don't want to be hypervigilant. Um, that's like way on, you know, the end of the spectrum, like always looking out to make sure that people are not being triggered. So we don't need to do that, but it's nice to have just like a nice, healthy amount of empathy. Um, do we know how to read body language, vocal intonation? Um, do we know how to check in like, Hey, um, are you feeling grief because, um, your family member just passed away? Like, how is, how is the, how are you feeling today about that? What do you need? And then this one can be really tough and sometimes a huge barrier to making progress. Are you ready to be accountable for how your actions make other people feel? That one is just so huge. And a lot of people are not ready to be accountable for how they make other people feel. So they just avoid feeling altogether. And so let's talk about emotionally attuned management. This is a fun thing that I've created, the aloof to overbearing, bearing, get it, haha. Ha. It's Goldilocks and the three bears. Um, the aloof to overbearing spectrum of managers. So Goldilocks is looking for porridge. It's not too cold, not too hot. It's just right. And so we have on one end of the spectrum, the aloof manager. And this is where we may have the reaction like, hello, pay attention to me. Where are you? Um, and over on the other side, we have the overbearing manager where we're like, oh my gosh, please leave me alone. And they may be micromanaging us all the time. A well-attuned manager feels just right. And that's what we're, that's what we're looking for. And as managers, we're looking to get into this nice middle well-attuned section. 
So here's some qualities, and you might have some other ones that I'm missing of aloof managers. And aloof means removed or distant, either physically or emotionally. So um, they often don't offer feedback or compliment your work. They don't um, check on your work or mentor you to see, you know, hey, how are you doing? How can we get better? What resources do you need? Um, sometimes they don't even ask how you're doing, or maybe they don't care. Um, they do not seem to understand what you might need or when you might need it. Um, and I also want to say that we may have normalized our needs not being met at work, but it is totally normal and appropriate to have an attuned manager who does offer these things. Okay. Um, so be on the lookout for ways that you may have normalized these. Um, no project plan. So they're not communicating with anyone and what the mission is and why we're doing our work. Um, they maybe they just don't seem around, seem like they're around very often to help. Um, and they may miss important deadlines. Like I've even had a boss that was very aloof about paying me on time. That was so stressful. He would just be like, oh, sorry, I and I'm out of the country. I'll pay you, you know, when I get back. And it's like, oh, I'm living paycheck to paycheck here. Um, and, you know, just not being able to empathize with that. Um, this is a big one I hear from a lot of people. They don't give you any training. And yet they wonder why, you know, why can't you just do this? Well, hello, I need some more resources. Okay, the porridge, that's too hot, overbearing managers. So these are the managers who really overwhelm and overpower us, okay? And um, this can feel uh, very toxic and of course, overwhelming. So they micromanage everything. What are you doing now? What are you doing now? Did you call that person I said you were supposed to call, but did you do it now? Oh, you're gonna do it later, but I want you to do it now. Um, and I hear this from so many people, it drives us all absolutely bonkers. Um, and it just, it just really rattles us. Um, they may stop by your cubicle unannounced or call you on teams at any given hour. Um, they don't give you any decision-making authority and you kind of don't own any decisions or tasks and they, they do not trust you. Um, they really dislike boundaries or don't have any. So they're expecting you to work after hours, expecting you to respond after hours and they're upset if you don't. Um, and they may have really unreasonable expectations. So they may be expecting a certain output of work that's like not even within the scope of your job description. Um, and they may not understand that that's not what you were hired to do. And it's also not what you're able to do. And I've heard that from a lot of people with managers like this. And they definitely cannot tell how their actions make you feel. And they um, oftentimes don't have a capacity to care. So these might be our managers that have a dark triad personality with elements of narcissism, sociopathy, and Machiavellianism. So now we're getting to the just right porridge, the managers that feel so good and soothing and enlivening to our nervous system. And so they are attuned and they are aware and attentive and responsive, okay? They know what the company's mission is. They know um, how we need to get it done and when and who's gonna do what. And they're communicating this really well and regularly. And everyone has a really detailed job description. So everyone knows the scope of their role. And if the scope needs to be renegotiated, that happens, that's super healthy. You're not just expected to do something else um, with no conversation or um, a, a conversation about new agreements. Um, they honor boundaries. They don't call you after hours. And furthermore, they have an understanding of why that's important, which feels really good. And they trust their employees and they offer unconditional positive regard, which means I trust that people are doing the best they can with the resources they have. And I had a wonderful boss once who had said, um, if, if an employee I manage is not thriving, I know that I, as their manager, am not giving them the resources that they need. So I need to figure that out. And I learned a lot um, from that teaching. And that's unconditional positive regard. Um, they know just the right amount of oversight and training that's needed for each task or project. So that maybe they, they hired you, they know what you're an expert in, they know what you do well. And so when they give you a new project, they're kind of like, oh, this, you're going to be able to run with this. They, and if that needs to be rene renegotiated, they will, but they often kind of have a really good intuition or they might be like, Hey, 
this is a project that I think is going to be just out of scope for you. Let's make sure we meet every day for 10 minutes to make sure, you know, that you're not feeling overwhelmed and let me, and I'll give you the resources you need. They seem to know what that's going to be. They check in at regular intervals. They care about how you're feeling. They notice if something isn't right. They ask about it and they give you presence and engagement and conversations. They pay attention to you. And I think that we all know um, someone, hopefully, hopefully we've had an attuned manager, but think about a time you felt safe and cared for by your manager. And just take a moment to breathe and feel into this memory and think about what did they do that helped you feel so safe. Okay, so now we're at the part where I'm going to teach some tips and tricks and skills. So I um, come back to this quote um, from Dr. Gaber Mate, trauma expert. I come back to this quite a bit when I'm thinking about what people need. He says, the research literature has identified three factors that universally lead to stress, and that is uncertainty, the lack of information, and the loss of control. And so we want to think about how we can, how we can give people certainty, information, and control. Okay, we want to think about how we can gift that to our employees so they feel really good and the stress is reduced. So tip number one of preventing burnout and getting your team in a tuned harmony, just like the choir, um, provide a safe and clear structure. So this would mean having a strategic action plan communicating the structure in writing, having agreements, team agreements. This is what we do and when we do it and who do, does what. And when we want to renegotiate our agreements, this is how we do it. Um, we have a really clear mission and goals and everyone knows that their tasks relate back to the plan that relates back to the mission. I see a lot of nonprofits really skip this and it leads to lower morale. They invest in really good project management skills and development so that that structure that helps people feel safe and knowledgeable um, and in control is there and boundaries are honored. Okay, tip number two, give people autonomy and authority. So um, when people feel like they have no control over their environment, that's very, 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 very stressful. Okay, so um, setting up a structure so that people know within the scope of their role what tasks they're in charge of and can make decisions about is going to really help lower that stress. And if you don't trust the person with these types of decisions, you may have hired the wrong person or they may need more training or they may be in the wrong role. Okay. But when you hire really qualified people, you should be able to trust them um, to do their job. So for example, you can make this these decisions without me if they um, cost us $500 or less, but if they're bigger stakes or cost more, then let's schedule a meeting and discuss. So those um, agreements are really clearly defined. Tip number three, um, practice emotional intrapersonal attunement, okay? So this is the one where we go inside. And I hate to say it, but we are just not going to be able to show up for people that we manage if we don't show up for ourselves first. That's the bummer news. <laughs> so um, things that help with that are meditation, womp womp. I know it really does work. Yoga is nice because it's like this thing where we're really taking an hour to feel how our body feels. Like it just really is actually very good for getting in tune with how we feel. Um learning presencing practices and using them during stressful moments. And we will practice one here. Um, taking breaks, going for walks throughout the day and emotion labeling and journaling. So let's do this presence exercise now. So go ahead and wherever you're sitting, like kind of straighten up, uh, shoulders back. And we are just going to notice the five senses. And this is a really good and sneaky one that we can do in meetings. Um, if we feeling like really dysregulated or dissociated way up in our head, then, um, we can always use this one to come back into the present moment. Okay. So you can close your eyes to start and now just pay attention to what you can hear. And now notice what you can smell. 
And now notice what you taste. And just notice. And now take your hand and touch something, your desk, your pant leg, an object, and just notice what it feels like. And then open your eyes and pick an object to look at and really notice the color and the texture and the shape and the size and just notice it. <sighs> and now we're back in the present moment with all of our senses. So there are a lot of other presencing exercises. You can Google them that really help us to be present for employees. The SIFT model is um, similar, tuning inward, and it's by Dan Siegel, an amazing um, uh, development researcher, really big on attunement. Um, and in fact, he wrote a huge tome called Interpersonal Neurobiology, um, all about this deep dive. So you can check that out if you really want to nerd out. And so his practice, the SIFT model, is tuning inward with loving kindness, non-judgment, and compassion. That's like a whole bunch of work in and of itself. But we want to notice our sensations. So that's what we just did. Images, so things that may be coming into our mind, feelings, and thoughts. And this is part of what we do in meditation as well, where we kind of, those thoughts or sensations or feelings come up, you know, we kind of just let them drop and float down the river. So feelings journal, this is always my top number one recommended practice. I teach a lot of habit change courses and I'm always like, you have to do the feelings journal. And, and um, so <laughs> it is really important. Um, it could be tedious, but it could be really fun. I find that it regulates me every time. If I'm feeling super, super, super stressed and dysregulated and I can sit down and write down a few feelings at 180. So um, feelingswheel.com, such a good resource. That's where this wheel is from. And you can just go through and see what which ones, because these words are not at the tip of my tongue. So you want to name the feeling and notice where you feel that feeling in the body. And just try and make that a daily practice. You're going to, if you can label your own, you're going to be able to show up and attune well to the people you manage. Tip number four the interpersonal attunement, okay? So this is making sure that you have employee check-ins at regular intervals, right? And that's that part of making people feel safe, that they can anticipate when they're gonna meet you and they know they can count on it. So that's gonna help lower stress. Um, asking your employees how they feel and listening without reacting or judging or relating or saying that reminds, I mean, you can, you can be like, oh, I've been feeling stressed too, but maybe also get curious. Hey, what's coming up for you? Is it work related? Is it outside of work? Um, be open to hearing feedback and solutions. Um, and then of course being fully present so that we can give our full attention. Tip number five, practicing deliberate interpersonal empathy. And this is what I tend to work uh, the most with managers on. Um, it's not as intuitive as it sounds. Of course, we all like to think of ourselves as being empathetic and we are, but when it comes to work, the problem is that we get so stressed all the time that we forget to practice it. So we may be like, you know, um, Jane messed up this thing and now it's a mess and I'm so upset and we may take it out on them, which um, will lower morale for everybody involved, um, instead of slowing down and practicing deliberate empathy. Okay. So that's just slowing down. And, and if there's something that we're upset about, just wondering and having curiosity about, well, I wonder how they feel. I wonder if they're experiencing any stress right now. And given that they always try their best, can I be curious about what's happening without the anger or intense emotion? Okay. Tip number six, this is the last one. Um, think about how you can co-regulate uh, your employees and colleagues when they're stressed. So if you're in a, in a this is borrowing from the parenting realm. Um, so in the parenting realm or in the teaching realm, they'll say, you know, you can co-regulate with students who are, um, who are dysregulated. So if you're a teacher and you have a student that's kind of 
bouncing around or um, really intensely angry that you can offer them your own inner calm instead of meeting them where they are. And so we often don't realize that we have the power to hold space and be the calm one when someone else is dysregulated. And oftentimes in interpersonal relationships, our biggest fights and conflicts happen when both partners are dysregulated and in um, the kind of uh, fight or flight mode, like really emotional. Dan Siegel will say the lid is the lid is flipped. So your, your rational brain isn't online anymore. And you have your amygdala. Um, it goes along with this hand motion where the outside is your cortex of your brain and the lid is flipped. And now you're in the amygdala, your fear state. And but so we kind of forget that we can decide, you know, when the other person is stressed to keep our lid on and provide that co-regulation to help them come down to our level. And this takes a lot of practice. Okay, so, you know, of course, like all these tips, um, I put them out there and, and I hope that you can use them right away, but it can be really hard to do them ourselves. So um, we can help at 10 Collective, we can help you, your organization, your business, your agency, um, get attuned and um, kind of sing in harmony and make beautiful work together. And so we can do organizational assessments, just see where you're already at, what are um, what are the bottlenecks to doing your best, most harmonized work? We offer one-on-one -on -one management, coaching, leadership development, and um, a whole host of training series on trauma-informed care, psychological safety. We can do communication skills, conflict resolution skills, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, and so much more. And again, from the beginning, I said, you know, we just didn't get the social emotional learning skills and they're so learnable. So we would love to come in and teach those. So habit change can be so hard. And the thing is, um, you know, I got my master's degree in public health and over and over and over and over again, the public health interventions that worked the best was when a coach would come in and work with someone one-on-one, -on -one. you know, for example, like a breastfeeding coach or these types of things. But so when it comes to work, because we're in such a, uh, an individualist um, society, we take it for granted sometimes like, I don't need anybody. I'm fine. But having a coach can help us make that deliberate change, change our micro habits. You know, they say neurons that wire together, fire together. So we get set in these ruts and it, it often takes a coach to help us get out and form those new neural pathways. And it feels really good to have support. So at 10 Collective, we know that being able to rest within a small bubble of care in our workplaces gives us so much strength and resilience. With all of the uncertainty in the world right now, if you can find strength in your workplace and have it be a place of, of safety um, and support, that is going to make a huge difference in your entire life. So this is an overview of all the different services that we offer. We offer traditional public health services as well, such as grant writing and program creation, implementation and evaluation, community management, educational content creation, um, and community needs assessment. So, but we're grounded in our commitment to inside out work. So we want to help you do the work inside before you can do it with the populations that you serve. So these are some of the things that we can help you achieve. And here is a list of additional resources. Um, what My Bones Know is an amazing memoir by Stephanie Fu, where um, she practices attunement with attunement expert, Dr. Jacob Hom, who I have met um, on Zoom. He attended a event that I produced called uh, The Art of Attunement. That's actually where I very first heard about attunement in 2020. Um, where if you listen to the audiobook version, she actually plays recordings of their therapy sessions and then like their discussion of how well they were attuning with each other. It's, it was really mind blowing. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, Dan Siegel, he's at UCLA. He has so many, so much content. I mean, you, you'll never even be able to read or watch it all. So there's videos, there's books. Um, and then some of the books that I mentioned, like A General Theory of Love and When the Body Says No, but additionally, Atlas of the Heart is 
a gorgeous, gorgeous book. And it's just all the emotions and kind of a deep dive into what the different emotions are and what they feel like. Just an amazing book. And then to help us read body language better, what everybody is saying is a great book for that. So we have some events coming up. Um, this is this one is happening with Brie now next week. <laughs> um, I hope you can make it. We have one with Danielle. And if you just go to 10collective.com slash events, you can sign up for all of these. We have this um, book club event with the author, Dr. Darsha Narvaez, um, restoring the kinship worldview, uh, honoring indigenous voices. And then we do have offer free job grief support groups for those who may not have a safe work environment and want to feel a supportive community. So let's talk about how we can help your organization. Um, please be in touch if you are curious about any of our services.